Mark just stopped and said they forgot to change the clock up there. I think he was afraid I was going to preach for an hour and a half. <laughs> Amen. Morning, New Holland. Thanks for coming to God's house. How many of y'all enjoyed losing an hour's sleep last night? How many of you will enjoy being able to go home tonight and it still be light outside? One of the most exciting days when I was a kid was when they changed time because I could go home after church and go outside and play. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. I still had time to play. Nothing changed except my perspective. That sounds like a, like a good sermon right there, doesn't it? Nothing really changes in life, but maybe we can change everything with our perspective. If you have your Bible, open to Acts 2. The last six weeks, I know we have a high five, but it took us six weeks to get through them. Something about some snow on a Sunday afternoon, I don't know. But it was good. That was actually one of my favorite services in a, in a while, was that Sunday afternoon when it snowed in the morning, or we still had some uh, snow on the ground in the morning. By the time we got here at 3 o'clock, it was nice and dry and good, and just a great spirit in God's house. By the way, I thank you for bringing that great spirit with you. I thank you for having your quiet time at home and letting God fill your heart and just coming and letting it overflow. Um, New Holland, it's been a year today, a year ago today, I preached my first sermon as your pastor. Amen. Yeah. So I'm, I was checking to see if anybody had any rotten tomatoes they were going to throw or not, but <clears throat> I didn't see it. And, um, you know, it, the latest thing is this coronavirus. Have you, you have heard about it. I, I, I read yesterday that, um, and, and by the way, from the Washington Post, I read this, probably not what you would call the, the greatest conservative paper that we have in our country. So uh, they're, they're trying to make politics out of everything, even uh, this coronavirus. And they were talking about how it was breaking out in this one area. And as of the Washington Post yesterday, so I don't know the datedness of it, there have been 19 deaths. 19 deaths. Most have uh, come, uh, most are affected or in our senior adults that may be sick or run down or their immune system be down. But 14 of those 19 deaths came from the same health facility in Seattle, Washington. So they're, they're, they're once again trying to scare everybody to death. We just sang, Lord, I need you. And we're going to fist bump or elbow bump or hip bump or whatever y'all do. High five, I don't know. Um, but let me just remind y'all, um, nothing's new under the sun. The Lord is still on the throne. You bless you. Bless you. Pass out some mask over here. I, we, we called this week trying to get hand sanitizer. Did y'all know everybody was sold out of hand sanitizer? I mean everybody. When the $2 store is out of hand sanitizer, we're in trouble. That's about how they make half their markup for the week, right? But yet, uh, Laura, our great and wonderful, precious secretary, found some from Gainesville Janitorial. So, uh, some's on the way. So, just, uh, can I just say, God's got this. Right? And fear is a liar. And it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. Can, can you listen to your pastor for just a moment? Take a big sigh of relief. <sighs> God's got this, right? Now, for those of you who are scared to death, um, you're more than welcome to stay at home. Of course, you're going to stay at home anyway. And you can watch us online. And uh, uh, Ricky Davis wanted me to tell you that you can text your tithe in digitally. <laughs> Amen? Keep the tides coming, and everything will be fine. But I just want you to know, um, though the world says everything's upside down, I think God's smiling on us. I think we have looked at these six weeks, looking at our mission statement for our church that we've had. I tried to date it back, uh, 
basically two mission statements in probably 20 years. Um, maybe longer than 20 years, Brother Mark. Maybe uh, somewhere in the early 90s, <clears throat> the first mission statement. that uh, The second one was a tweet of the first when Mike Taylor uh, was here. But there's nothing wrong with that mission statement. There's one, it's, it's wonderful. It's fine. You've heard me say great things about it, and I, you will continue to hear me say great things about it. But uh, we began by asking you how many of you knew what the mission statement was, and now some of you have it memorized. And Mark's put it up on the screen so we can look at it. And, and we know that mission statements are important. As a matter of fact, about that same time, about 1993, is when all the churches decided that they needed to have a mission statement. It's like they didn't know what they were doing, so now they were going to come up with a statement to tell them what they're doing. And that's fine. That's good. And, and the, the corporate world has caught on to it, and they, there are businesses that say this is what our, our vision statement is, and some of them sound like the Constitution. I mean, just long and elaborate, and you scratch your head and say, huh? Some of them uh, are so vague and short, like... Uh, to um, love God and bring him glory. Now, trust me, I'm not against that either. I think we should love God, and I'm grateful, for, grateful that he gets all the glory in all things. Ours is longer than that, but there are five main points, and we brought them down into our high five. Let's try this again. Y'all watching? The first one is what? Say it loud. That's right. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second one is what? <clears throat> Say it together. That's right. The great commandment is to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. That means a bond of fellowship with other people. This is one of the ones that's the most overlooked. It's fellowship. It's vital. It's vital. God put us together as a church. Let's do that together. Number three is evangelism. Remember the three crosses. Christ in the center. One who said, remember me when you go into your paradise. The other one turned his back on God. That is evangelism, right? The fourth one is discipleship. Remember the four quadrants of your heart. All your heart trying to be like Christ. And by the way, disciples make disciples. That is the great commission. Go ye therefore. Teach all nations, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. We are to be discipled and to disciple others. That's the fourth one, discipleship. And the fifth one is service. We are to serve others. God, how many of y'all are blessed? Amen. How many of you are grateful? How many of you know someone else who probably could could use a hand up. Serve. Serve. And by the way, I keep saying this. If you see someone serving, give them thumbs up. That's what I say in Jesus' name. Let the, Encourage them in everything that you do. So we want to have a living mission statement. One of the things I found out about churches with mission statements is they usually write them. They put them on the front of their constitution and bylaws. They stick them on a wall somewhere them in a book and we never look to them again most of them are copied they went to a conference somewhere and they heard something and they came back and they were fired up and they said if we do this then we'll be successful well writing it is one thing living it is what God wants us to do you see I believe Acts 2 tells us it's the normal overflow of the Christian life if you're just seeking God, you may not even know what all the high five are, but if you're just seeking God, these are the things that will naturally flow from Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now hear this, and hear this well. We have a God, God the Father. Amen? God sent His Son for us. Amen? And God the Father and Jesus the Son sent the Holy Spirit on our behalf. Amen? And God the Father and Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit sent the church. Right? That's the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And they want to come and embody themselves, their spirit in us, in the church. God's people. This generation. This generation. Today. 
We meet God in our right now. We come to this place <clears throat> not to hear about God, but to meet God. We come not just to, to, to worship Him and preach about Him and sing Him, but to, to revel in Him, to grow in Him, to, to be excited by Christ in us. And when we leave this place, this is what Mark said last Sunday morning. When he spoke, he said, the church is what leaves this place. Well, we're not just when we gather here, but when we go, that's when we're the church. That's when we're Christ in the community. So the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, they, they've sent us, the people of God, the church of God, into the world. It's the normal flow, but there are distractions. There are normal distractions. Y'all know the, the, the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. Do y'all know the unholy trinity? The unholy trinity is me, myself, and I. If we're not careful in our life, we'll forget God the trinity, and we'll follow the unholy trinity of only doing what's good and right for us, what we want to do. So there's normal distractions, and there's also satanic distractions. You start trying to do for God, you start trying to serve him with all your heart. You start trying to do the right thing. Listen to me now. Even good things will get in the way. How many of y'all have ever knelt down to pray and 20 things enter your mind that are distractions to get you away from praying? Things that you probably could do, should do. I mean, it got so bad in my life at one time, I would take a pad and a pencil and I would be praying and I'd stop and I'd write it down and I'd go back to praying. Because I didn't, want to, I didn't want to stop my time with God because all those things were flowing. You know, isn't it funny the times that we think about these things? So our, our core value needs to be front and center in everything we do. How do we do that? I do not want to preach six sermons and that be it. Put it back in the book, shut it, put it back in the drawer. I want it to be the life flow from us. So here is... What I want to talk to you about today that I think will help us to understand this, and I want to describe this as granite and sand. Granite and sand. If you put it in granite, you're not really expecting to change it. I literally know of a church who put up a church sign and put the pastor's name in granite. They etched it in there. I mean, he meant to stay. Amen? Even, even if he stayed his whole life, he's still going to die. What do you do then? They literally put paper over it. I'm serious. It was dog ugly. Everybody knew what happened. But literally, there are some things that we put down in granite because they're never going to change. Worshiping God, fellowshipping with each other, being about the master's business, telling other people, that is our privilege. People want to say it's not our responsibility. It is our responsibility. Anybody who has seen the cross of Calvary and know the power of, of the blood of Christ and how it was shed, it is, there is a movement of Satan in the world that is trying to tell us that that's all God and, and you don't have to do anything there. If you love God, share with someone that God died for them. I understand it's God's work. I understand that he's sovereign. I understand that he's the only one that can save. But we are to be on mission with him. He called us and sent us to go. We are not just supposed to, 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 to walk through life as we want. We should grow. And that takes intentionality and effort. We need to be disciples. We don't need to sit back. We need to go forward. And we, it's not about us. We need to be serving. Those are granite. Two millenniums ago, we see them in Acts chapter 2. Take your Bible. You don't have to stand with me. Look in verse 40. We've read these three times. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Peter was telling them, You need to get right with God. Now's the time that you need to be saved. Does that not sound like evangelism? Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. Evidently, 
they heeded the call. And they were saved. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Does that not sound like discipleship? And fellowship. Well, does that sound like fellowship? They were together, and they were being discipled together, and they fellowshiped together, the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Breaking of bread, that sounds like fellowship. Prayers, that sounds like worship. Spending time together. Verse 43, fear came upon every soul. That is, the awe of God came upon every soul. That sounds like worship again. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. That's service. God working through his people. God chose to do that, and people were open to that. It was the movement of God through his people. Being filled with the Spirit. That means they could not do it, but the Spirit acting upon them, they could do what they could not do before. That's the normal Christian life. Now all who believed were together and they had all things in common. Sounds like service again. They sold their possessions and goods and divided them among, among all as anyone had need. They were moved by the Spirit of God that others were in need and they said, I have abundance, let me serve someone who does not. That's the movement of God. Verse 46, so in continuing daily with one another, uh, with one, in one, oh, let me try 46 again. Continuing daily with one accord. In the temple, worship, and breaking bread from house to house, fellowship, and ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, worship, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. God added the people to the church. Evangelism. Isn't that amazing? This is granite. We need to keep them front and center because we'll get off track. I pray all the time, Lord, Keep me on the straight and narrow. If I move off this way, bring me back. If I move off this way, bring me back. We need to have time. I hope you listen, New Holland. As individuals, where we look at our hand and say, God, do I worship you with all my heart? How often do I worship you with all my heart? Lord, am I, am I isolating or am I seeking to have fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ? Lord, how long has it been since I told someone? People are afraid of the framework of evangelism. Can I just share something that will take the burden off your shoulders? How long has it been since you bragged on Jesus? How long has it been that your heart was so full that you just had to tell somebody what Christ had done for you? And what are you seeking to do to grow closer? We've got these groups on Sunday morning. We call it Sunday school. You call it whatever you want to, but a group of people comes together and they study word, God's Word together and they share. And, and, and I might not, somebody might say something that I've never seen before. Look, I've been a Christian 47 years. It still happens to me. There's a perspective that happens there as we get discipled to, to be like God. And five, we should be serving. These are the things that are always, we should look at our hand every week now let's talk about the sand. The granite never changes. The mission statement never changes. But New Holland, we also need something called a vision statement. And the vision statement changes all the time. All the time. As a matter of fact, if it's been 10 years since we've done a vision statement, we're, we're out of date. Because you see, things, some things never change. But what God does today may not be what God did yesterday or what God's going to do tomorrow. Our circumstances change. The Holy Spirit's with us and helps us to be on mission with Him. Let me see if I can explain this a little better. Take your Bible and turn to chapter 4. Jesus has ascended to heaven. Peter has preached on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 souls get saved. People are getting saved every day as, as people are talking with uh, the others about the Lord, sharing the, the good news of Jesus Christ with others. Others are, are accepting that. Great things are happening. And, and then those same people that crucified Jesus, 
pop up. Look in chapter 4, verse 1. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captains of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in, uh, preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. That sounds like the gospel. They laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. They arrested them. Look in verse 7. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, once again, this was not Peter preaching, but the Holy Spirit is now controlling him, leading him, guiding him, empowering him. Literally in the grammar, the word filled, that is speaking of, of, of Peter, is inactive. But the Holy Spirit is acting upon him. So when he's preaching, literally it's not what Peter thinks, it's what God is doing in his life. And it says here, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel. He goes off to tell them the great things of what God is doing. Look what it says in verse number 19. But Peter and John answered them. Well, let me back up to verse 8. Let me go all the way back to verse 17. Well, let's go back to verse 16. It's all good, folks. What shall we do to these men? For indeed that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We cannot but speak the things that we have seen and heard. You see, the circumstances changed. I mean, they're just sharing the gospel. 3,000 people get saved. They come in and it's like, hey, we got to stop this. Well, let's, do, let's threaten them. We can't kill them because a notable thing's been done. We can't kill them. But we'll let them know that if they don't stop. Now, listen, there was something behind that. These are the same people that crucified Jesus. You think it went through their mind? But they're like, whether it's right or wrong in God's eyes, y'all decide, but we got to do what God's... There's something that's bubbling out that we can't keep in. Circumstances changed, but the life of God continued on. Look in chapter 8. Let me see if I can make this a little more plain. In chapter 6, there was a group of, there was a need, so a group of men were set aside called servants. The word deacon literally means servants. It's taking the word and and Putting that word, spelling it in English, is deacon. But it means they were serving. One of them was named Stephen. That old preaching deacon got up and he used a great opportunity and preached. And by the way, got him. they threw rocks at him and stoned him until till he was dead. Now that's the setting. They warned them. Now they're following through chapter 8, verse 1. Now Saul was consenting to his death, that is Stephen's death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, which was at Jerusalem. And they were scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. You see, what happened now is they're killing them. So the, those, those believers in Jerusalem says, we'll just go to other places. Granted, doesn't change. Circumstances change. When he gave them the commission, he said, in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. You couldn't just stay in Jerusalem. That's where the temple was. They would have loved to launch everything that they did from the holy place of the temple. But, but no, circumstances changed. Sand. And they had to adapt. Now the vision is it's time for us to go forward. It's time for us to go anywhere and everywhere God is leading. Look in verse 4. 
Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the gospel. By the way, chapter 8 is where that other deacon named Philip goes to Samaria. Another sermon for another day. But do y'all remember John chapter 4 when Jesus went through Samaria? I must needs go through Samaria. Remember they got to that place and, and he told the other d- disciples, y'all go get some food, I'm going to stay right here at Jacob's well. And y'all remember the woman who walked to Jacob's well? It's another sermon for another day, but um, had five husbands and the one that she was living with now wasn't her husband. There was something going on there in her life. But Jesus changed her. And I, I love the fact that God's scripture says, and she went to the town and told the men. She knew the men. And she told all things that she had. Someone has told me everything about myself. And a revival, get this now, breaks out in Samaria, and then it's quiet. Now Philip's there. The disciples are being scattered. Great Commission. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and Philip goes to Samaria, and guess what happens? Bam! The Holy Spirit starts saying, seeds that were planted with the woman at the well get harvested later when circumstances changed and they couldn't stay in Jerusalem any longer, and they went forward, and God used a great outpouring of the Spirit of God. You think that's a coincidence? Not me. Not so at all. As a matter of fact, God called him from that meeting, sent him out to the desert because there was a eunuch that needed to hear about Christ. And the gospel went to Africa because circumstances changed. Are y'all listening? The mission is the same. Granted, circumstances change constantly. Well, let me go forward. Chapter 10. Peter's there, minding his own business, up on the rooftop in the afternoon, has a vision from God. Coincidentally, there was a Roman soldier, Caesarea, and he's having a vision from God too. Go send for for Peter. Simon Peter, he'll come. Now, Simon would not have come if, if, if God had not given him his vision. But when the when the people from the Roman soldier heard and it matched up with his vision, he left and went. Listen to me, church. He would have never gone if God didn't show him that everything you've done before is changing. I've got something new for you. So he went to the house of a Gentile, preached Jesus to them, and they got saved. And I don't know how many of y'all are Gentiles. I sure am. And I'm sure grateful that the the gospel was was shared with me as well. Amen? I'm breaking out of my coat here. Matter of fact, in chapter uh, uh, 11, Peter has to, well, read with me, chapter 11, verse 1. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. That's a nice way of saying they got in a fight with him. Saying, you went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. Y'all look up here. That to them was granite. You do not associate with people that don't do the religious things that we do. The problem was, it was granted to them, but it was sand to God. They were making granite out of things that they had no business making granite. Shifting sand, it comes and it goes. You see, that was, for them, how they ate and who they ate with 
was more important than the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the saddest things, New Holland, I'm grateful that, that you don't have this heart. The, the vast, vast majority of this church does not have this heart. But please, there are so many sad churches that are holding on to something that God could care less about. What God cares is the mission. What God cares is, is that we have a heart overflowing in love with Him and we love each other and, and that we're on mission of letting other people know that Christ died for them and we need to grow up in our faith and serve others. The high five are what matter, but this other stuff doesn't matter. And there are some people who are so quick to point it out and condemn I'm just grateful God doesn't. So in chapter 11, Peter tells them the story. What I love about this, y'all listen to me? When, when, when Peter told them the story, they relented and they said, Amen. Verse 17, if therefore God gave them the same spirit or same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I should withstand God? Verse 19. Then now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. They're pushing out even further. You get to chapter 13, and Barnabas is down there with this group of people in Antioch, and now they're sending out missionaries, saying, fresh vision. Fresh vision. They're taking it everywhere. You see, the mission statement is granite. The vision statement is sand. I don't have time to get into this today. I'm not going to get into it today. Y'all, give me three minutes. We need to know what God wants to do in Gainesville, Georgia, through New Holland in 2020. I've done demographic studies on us. I've looked at all those things that are about us. I've been looking at the history of this church and in this community. It's very interesting. You see, I think every church is unique. When we had Jay, our first child, you know, parents have dreams for their children, but guess what? That child's going to do what that child's going to do. They're going to grow up, and they're going to have their own dreams, and they're going to follow it. And you can, you can try to, to make that child do what you want, but that child's got its own vision of fo following it out. And it happened with Jared, and it happened with Jody, and I'm just like, I'm just grateful, God, you gave me three kids and whatever. The, what I learned to do as a parent is I was going to support whatever they wanted to do. And I wanted it to be fresh. I wanted to do it with them. So I coached basketball and I did everything. When, when Jay came home and said, Dad, can I run cross country? I said, I don't know, can you? I went to the first meet and I prayed. Oh my goodness, I prayed. Lord, let him finish. Lord, just let him finish. He took off and there was about 150 of them running. First race he ever ran, he came in 19th. I was doing backflips up in the stands up there. And there's one thing about having a dad like me. You know, they go, when they're doing cross country, they run into the woods and then they come out. My voice can be heard anywhere. <laughs> run, Jay! You can do it, boy! I wanted him to hear the encouraging word of his father even when he couldn't see me. You see... Different places in the race. This is 2020. We're 70 years into this building. We're 100 years, over 100 years in this community. There's something unique about a, a mill village community. Generations is a word that keeps coming back to me, kept coming back to me. There was a point in time in this community that, that multiple generations lived together, worked in the community, uh, went to school in this community, had careers that were long-lasting. I'm here to tell you that's not the way it is now. 
but the same desire generation-wise, it, it doesn't have to be the locality. That's not going to change. We're not going to make your family move back to the mill village. That's not going to happen. How many of y'all dro drove today over 20, 25 minutes to get here? Raise your hand. How many of you drove over 30 minutes to get here? Ethan, you did not. <laughs> you could fall down, trip twice, and roll and be here in 30 seconds. <laughs> Amen? But it, how many of you live within 10 miles? Demographics say 67,000 people live here right now. Their projection is that 86,000 will live here in 10 years. If y'all haven't noticed, we don't have to go search for them. They're coming to us. Right now, between 5 years old and 25 years old is 23% of our community. I hope you hear this. 10 years from now, it will be 34%. 11% higher. It is the biggest demographic that we have. Those over 55, you're only 6%. You're only 6% in a five-mile radius of this church. 5.8, I believe is what it is. I'm telling you, we may not change, but the community is. The mission of greater gains is upon us. Let the church be the church. Let the people rejoice. For we've settled the question. And we've made our choice. Let the anthems ring out. Songs of victory swell. For the church triumphant is alive and well. We can't go back to 1950 when this building was brand new. We're not asked to, but we are asked to find out what it is exactly that God wants to do with us. Now, let me, make, let me free you up a little bit. I told the search committee a year ago when I came here, I don't have a vision in my briefcase that I'm bringing with me. I think, that that's, I think that's wrong. A vision doesn't come with a person. It's not Brian's vision. A vision comes from the people. A vision comes as we see God's unique work in us. So, I'm not going to tell you what it is. And, and by the way, it's going to take us a while to figure it out. I could probably tell you from looking at you and knowing your heart, I could probably give you some hints of what God's going to do. But I'm here to tell you, it needs to be clear to all of us. We're never going to get 100% of the people to unite together. But I'm praying that we get 100% 100% of us will unite to maybe 80%. If we can agree on 80% of what God's doing, I believe that'd be a minor miracle. No, I think that'd be a major miracle. You see, I don't want to do anything that's painful except walk by faith and not by sight. If God calls us to it, I want to do it with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm not asking for you to come join me. I'm asking for all of us to come join God. Now, there are some things that we're going to do because they're granted. They're not going to change. So we're going, to push, we're going to pursue those with all of our heart. But the fresh vision that I believe energizes us. I believe the fresh vision from God that, that gives us clarity. That's what we need to find. So we're not going to take these mission statements and we're not going to put it back in a drawer someplace. We're going to seek to know what it means to do to live it out every day. And I think it's uh, a little funny. 
Eddie, I was thinking about your dad. I understand that he played baseball. And they had a baseball team here in the mill. Isn't it funny that in the next 10 years, the largest generation will be the young people again? 34%. I wonder what God's going to do. I don't know. I'm not asking y'all to come sign up for a ball team. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, God's already got this. God already knows. God's already brought you to be a part of it. You're here. God will bring us more people. Let's not make sand granite. Let's take advantage of what God's doing in our hearts today. I don't know about you, but I get excited when I think about it. The souls that will be saved, the lives will be touched. We will be faithful to live the good news in this community. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, God wants to change you. God wants to bless you. God wants to help you. Literally, if you would allow him to, he'll do a work in your life right now. Father, if there's anyone here today that does not know you as Savior and Lord, speak to them, call them by name. I remember how you did it to me. It was an irresistible force. Father, I am grateful that when I came to give my heart and life to you, that you heard me and you changed me, and I've never been the same. Lord, I don't want anybody to live in fear. I want them to live in peace and joy. Lord, let them receive what you, came, what you sent Jesus to give. Thank you, my Lord, my Savior, for doing what you did for us on the cross of Calvary, through the tomb, and rose again. But Father, may we be about your business. Those that already know you as Savior and Lord, may our commitment be to you and to you alone. But Lord, may we be willing to stand on the solid rock of Christ, and Lord, the circumstances of life, they, they always change. But you're the never-changing God. You have loved us with an everlasting love. Father, you called us to go forward. So Lord, may we join you in what you're calling us to do. Father, I pray for freedom during the time of the invitation. I pray for obedience one heart at a time. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.